We are so excited to announce that the Remedial Herstory Project will be having our first annual summer retreat coming to you in August of 2021. Join us here in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Kick back, relax, enjoy the spa and a little bit of women's history. We are so excited to be bringing some of the best women's historians in the world to you. They are here to teach you the bits of women's history that you may have missed in history class, and we are here to guide you on the tools that you will need to get them into the classroom. The retreat is 50% pedagogy and 50% women's history. You will leave with dozens of printed lesson plans, learning materials, and tools that you can use. You can see the entire schedule of events on our website, as well as the names of some of the historians who will be presenting www.remedialherstory.com. Look for the page about the summer retreat. Come relax and enjoy the White Mountains of New Hampshire with us. Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell everyone what's happening in today's episode? In today's episode, we are going to be seafaring women. Oh, my. (laughs) And we're joining Gudrid. And my new friend, Sarah Dunn, who's going to teach us about women in the Viking raiding civilizations. Arr. Arr. <laughs> Let's get into it. I don't know if they said R. We'll find Arr. It. I don't know. What's a Viking say? What do Vikings say? What does the fuck say? Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, the other 50% the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. Sexist Historians and Gudrid the Viking. Alternative title, Columbus Who? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, Brooke, I'm so excited. You know this, that Vikings discovered America before... Columbus. Yes, I'm an expert at Vikings. Let's talk all about it. Okay. So actually, I do want to start there. What do you, what do oh, you no. know about Vikings? Okay, so um, I have seen that series, Viking, which is very entertaining and super gory. But I have an interesting story. My dad is not super religious, but he we grew up on a lake, mm-hmm. and he wants to have a Viking funeral. And I don't know if you know this, in Viking culture – that they set you out on a raft and they light it on fire from archers from the shore when mm-hmm. you die. So your body's on this raft. Archers are on the shore with these lit... Um, are you the archer? Yeah. The, let me get to this. Okay. Right. Sorry. So then the <laughs> the bow and arrow goes out. The arrow hits the raft. It lights it on fire. And if the flame from the fire is the same color as the sunset, you get to go to Von Holland. Or Van, uh, Van... Yeah. I think that's what you say. It's like the heaven of... Mm-hmm. The Vikings. And it meant it meant you lived a good life and that you were a good man. And so my dad really wants this moment, which okay. is very interesting. There's a lot to talk about here of where do we get a raft? Can we put you out on the lake? Are we allowed to light you on fire? <laughs> Who is going to be the archer? And he goes, this sounds like a you problem. <laughs> <laughs> I need to meet your uh, dad. <laughs> and my dad's name is Dickie. And so I was like, okay, Dickie, I'll make that work. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, have a nice death, and I'll figure out your Viking funeral. <laughs> Sounds like a you problem. <laughs> like, logistics, not my problem. Death is going to happen. It's like, <laughs> sounds good, Dad. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. So, anyways, I don't know much about Vikings um, other than um, where they were located from, that they invaded in England a lot. Yeah. And raided, and... Um, yeah, that's about it. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because they are not sort of central to the progressive European narrative. So I feel right. like their story kind of gets left out in general, let alone women oh, who gosh, were yeah. among the Well, and the, from what I understand, the women in their community would fight as well. Like, they were all warriors. Yeah, so I'm really excited to introduce you to a historian working on this research. Mm -hmm. And um, I have asked her, because this is debated, um, the point that you just made about about women being being warriors and among the raiding parties and um, traveling with them, you know, around the world where they went. 
And, um, and so I'm really excited to chat with her and better understand the historical evidence that there is to support that. And she's just a wealth of knowledge. So why don't I have her introduce herself awesome. to us? Great. So my name is Sarah Dern. I am a journalist and author uh, and tend to write a lot about medieval history. That's amazing. And you just recently had an article published by the Smithsonian Magazine. Could you tell I us did. about that? Yes, I just had an article published with the Smithsonian Magazine about Gudrid, who is this Viking female traveler who was alive around the year 1000. And the article basically is an investigation into whether or not she existed, which is a question scholars grapple with but spoiler alert she did in my opinion <laughs> um yeah and it, she's remarkable she's traveled farther than any other recorded viking man um if all the the sagas the icelandic sagas that hold her story are to believe to be believed she traveled she's born in I iceland travels to Greenland amongst some of the first settlers in Greenland and then from Greenland travels tries to get to the new world a place called Vinland in the Viking sagas literally wine land um one saga says that she doesn't make it and she crashes and she just barely makes it back to Greenland but then eventually with her next husband she does make it to the new world and then she's there for several years, gets all these new, uh, very cool items to sell back in Norway, goes back to Norway, and then eventually goes to Iceland again, and then goes on pilgrimage to Rome and back to Iceland. So that's like her trajectory, which is insane because this is the year 1000. So you're thinking like no roads, only Viking ships. Viking ships were amazing, but they weren't you know, nothing on modern day ships. And yeah, she's remarkable. So this article that she wrote for the Smithsonian Magazine is incredible and people mm. can check it out. Um, and I just think it is so cool that she found this evidence of this I know, woman. I'm very curious how she found this evidence of this woman and like where she comes from. Yeah, so here's what she said. Oh, awesome. I came across Gudrid. How did I learn about her? I, it's been a minute I've known about her story. I'm trying to think of like how exactly I first came across her. I think it was just, I'm in the preliminary stages of working on my second book, which is going to be about female travelers throughout history and sort of plotting throughout history, these different women who've traveled extensively from Egyptian female merchants that traveled extensively across the Mediterranean to early Christian pilgrims who traveled extensively throughout the Holy Lands to people like Gudrid. So I think it's probably in that research I came first across her. And then she was so remarkable that I ended up write, reading this whole book about her and eventually writing for the Smithsonian on it. So as always, I'm curious about why the guests we have on think that this isn't well taught in school. Yeah, it's always a good topic. And I'll be honest, I don't think I teach the Vikings very well it's in not well school. Covered. No. I and think we cover it in middle school from what I remember because I can remember building Viking ship replicas. Oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, that's about all I remember from it. So it was a great lesson. But yeah, yeah, I just remember that they were very well known for their ship making. Yeah, they were definitely sophisticated for the time. Um, but I think that you know, specifically women's history. Um, and we've talked on previous episodes about how women get sort of used in history, mm -hmm. left out or included in order to like build sympathy or make other people seem more menacing than right. not. Um, and so I think that's definitely a bit at play here. Um, but of course I asked Sarah what she thinks yes, and this is what she said. Yeah. I mean, my high school was so funky. Like we I feel like I have a kind of solid sense of U.S. history, but anything really beyond the U.S., I just, we didn't touch on. 
Like we didn't, I think some high school curriculums learn at least about Leif Erikson, mm. who's the first Viking recorded Viking in the sagas to make it to Vinland, to make it to the new world. So this is like, you know, five, like around like 450 years before Columbus set sail. So just the whole, I mean, we know the Columbus narrative of discovering the new world is super problematic. I knew of that history, but I had no understanding of the Viking history or just Vikings in general. I think I learned about them sort of in passing, you know, because you know about Vikings and you think they're like, you know, these mean, I'm going to kill you people of the Middle Ages that rape and pillage and destroy monastic sites. But I think the reason why we don't learn much, especially about female Viking history, a lot of times it's such a soapbox of mine, but so, so much of basically history and the ideas that of history as a discipline starts out in the Victorian period. And especially with the middle ages and the Viking period, um, sort of as part of the middle medieval history, Victorians were super sexist and had a lot of really messed up notions around women and women needing to be attached to the household. And so that has reverberated and echoes in scholarship of medieval history and Viking history, especially. During that period, you have British imperialism. So you have England basically conquering a lot of the world. Um, You have industrialization. So the landscape and economy of Europe and of England specifically is changing very rapidly. So there's this whole nostalgia for the past um, and trying to understand as this like becoming global superpower of like, who are we though as English people? Like who, what is our history? And so that's sort of the impetus to go back to the medieval history and be like, well, this is our history. It's King Arthur. And like, then you have legends of King Arthur getting, you know, reworked by different romantic authors and there's just a fascination with it so that sexism of that period gets imbued in the history itself and in the early scholarship so figures like Gudrid just get forgotten about in Viking society there is evidence to suggest that women did have a lot of power especially comparatively to other societies at the time Women, especially widows, um, could inherit property. They would have had the right to divorce. Um, We have records of Viking queens, you know, giving laws and setting, you know, uh, managing disputes between different neighbors and stuff. So they had a lot of power. That shouldn't be... Um, something that's debated, but it is something still debated. Oftentimes there's this whole like scholarship around Viking women being buried with keys and keys are some sort of uh, like a symbol of the house, but there's almost just as many Viking men buried with keys. And there's not really all that many women who are buried with keys, but it was just like this thing in the Victorian period, like, Oh, here's a woman. She's buried with a key. She must've been like controlling the house. And that's all to say. So Viking women, you know, they didn't have certainly the rights we have today as women, but they had a lot of rights and they are in the sagas. So most of the Viking history that we get from the Viking perspective are in these sagas, um, is in the Viking sagas. And mainly they're recorded in Iceland around like 250, 1350. And in those sagas, it mostly follows the stories of men. But there are a lot of strong female characters in those sagas as well. Gudrid exists in two sagas. The saga of the Greenlanders and the saga of Eric the Red, which are both Icelandic sagas. She plays a relatively minor role in both. She's not the main character. She is maybe fights to be the main character in the saga of the Greenlanders at the beginning. Um, But her story, it's mainly the story of the men. Um, We think there was maybe a saga of Gudrid specifically, but that's been lost to history. When we're talking about Vikings today, the main, what most scholars are doing today are matching the Viking sagas with archeological evidence. The sagas 
it's sort of our equivalent to, you know, a TV show based on medieval history or based on history, but isn't actually history. Like it's entertainment first and then secondary, like maybe has some historical tie-ins. That's a bit of what the sagas are. They, they weren't meant to be a history textbook in any way. They're really like novels. There's a lot of scholars compare them to, and some say they're even like the first novels of human society. So she's talking here about the different sagas that are mm. written, and there are two that Gudrid's story come out of. And the fact that two different sagas mention her, I think, is pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, Do you but, think that that gives it, like, relevance or that there is truth to that then? Well, I'm not really sure because in history there's always circumstances where – things could be the same thing. Like in the Bible, the flood that Noah, you know, saves yep. everybody from, um, that there's a flood that sounds really similar to it in the Epic of Gilgamesh, which comes out of Mesopotamia. So is it possible that these authors are talking about the same flood? Yeah, it's definitely possible. Um, okay. So, so just having corroborating sagas it could could be the same thing. I mean, it, it makes sense. Like when you say it's like okay, these two different sagas are mentioning the same person. Yeah, it does make it seem much more realistic that she lived and right. this was real. Yeah, this but how do you like how do you prove that? How do you prove it? Right, and I think that gets to like just the question of like literature, right? Like literature is not, and the sagas were not intended uh, to. be, be, right, she says they're they're intended to be entertainment, right? right? And so what we say when we're trying to entertain people versus what we say when we're trying to inform people are very different things. Are they? Yeah. <laughs> Have you heard of the the fish tales? <laughs> right. <laughs> Fake news, yeah. Fake news, oh yeah, that, yeah, that too. Um, so I'm not really sure. And so what I'm curious about is she talks a little bit about how they're, you know, they're trying to take these sagas and find archaeological evidence that oh, cool. supports it. And I'm just curious if there is enough archaeological evidence to give... What's enough? Uh, right, I know, and what is enough? Like, you know, where do scholars land on on that question? Like I found a fork. I found one fork. So does that make a meal? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this is getting into a weird hypothetical. <laughs> I, yeah, we can live there. Okay. But all right. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what she said. What's really cool is that, especially in Iceland, this is really on the cutting edge in Iceland in particular, because so much Iceland was a colony founded by Vikings. So obviously they're very invested in Viking history and they have the most recorded sagas written in Iceland. So a lot of times archaeologists in, in Iceland will use the sagas to find different historical sites that then they do archaeology on. And with Gudrid in particular, they have found her house in Iceland at Glombar. And, you know, some archaeologists are like kind of hedge their bets and they're like, we don't know who lived here, but according to the sagas, Gudrid would have lived there at the time when the house was built, at the time, you know, at, in this specific location, at this time, the saga mentions this house where Gudrid lived. So some scholars are willing to, you know, make that leap and be like, it's Gudrid's house. Other scholars are like, yeah, I don't want to do that because, you know, we can't really prove that Gudrid lived there. But there's a lot of things like that, especially, I mean, I know mostly Gudrid's story, um, having written this article. So we have in Newfoundland and Canada, a Viking settlement where the Vikings, it was basically a staging post to do more exploration inland to Vinland into the new world. And it's called La Onks Meadows. And there they discovered a spindle whirl, of, which would have been used by Vikings to spin wool. We know that spinning wool, because of the sagas, was primarily classed as a woman's job. 
So the fact that they found this spindle whorl in La Anx Meadows proves that there were women there. And likely there wasn't just one woman because what singular woman would be like, hey, I'll just go on this expedition with only men. No woman would want to do that. Right. So we know and we know in general, like when Vikings would go on raids in England and across Europe, they would bring women with them. And I think I believe that uh, there were Viking female warriors, which is something still debated in scholarship. But I think the evidence is pretty convincing. There's actually a really good book coming out on the topic earlier, uh, later this summer called The Real Valkyrie by Nancy Marie Brown. Her book, she wrote a book on Gudrid. She's actually written two books on Gudrid, but one uh, um, is sort of a fictional saga of what Gudrid's life was. Like if we were to have the saga of Gudrid, what it would be. And then her other book on Gudrid is more about interviews with scholars and actually pulling apart the history. But she makes the argument in this new book of hers that women warriors did exist. And I agree with her argument. So as a history teacher, one of the things that was going through my mind a bit was kind of some embarrassment as I'm listening to her and realizing just like how little Viking history gets into my classes at all. And so I asked her a pretty pointed question, (laughs) which was basically just like, why should I, why should I be, like, why should I prioritize this over other histories? I mean, valid. And, and I, because I think that, you know, we're, we're getting into on this podcast constantly lesser taught stuff and, you know, and in particular women. Um, But I, I needed her to zoom out for me because if I'm going to talk about a specific Viking woman, I need to understand where she fits, where she fits in this bigger story, why she's important to that bigger story. Um, And so I asked her to tell me a little bit about the significance of the Vikings in European history broadly and American history, I guess, broadly too. Great. So this is what she said. The Viking raids in England were intense. They overthrow, they overthrew basically two, there's, I'm forgetting the exact number of kingdoms. Basically at the time when the Vikings come to England, there are, I believe, four main kingdoms. They overthrow most of them. And the only standing, the only guy left standing is Wessex. And it's because of the Viking raids in England that Wessex basically becomes able to take over all of England and therefore unite England. If it weren't for the Viking raids, I mean, who's to say, but there might not ever have been a united England. That's how devastating these raids were. And they were, their their army that comes to England is called the Great Heathen Army. And they had done raids before that, but the Great Heathen Army was something all the English kings had no understanding of how destructive these guys could be. And that's when they really overthrow these kingdoms. And it's like in less than a decade, it's really quick. Um, Something no one has ever done throughout history. You know, the Nazis tried, but they weren't able to. And all these different, well, I guess you could say that, um, William the Conqueror is able to kind of do it. But the only reason he's able to do it is because England is united under one king. You know, he wouldn't have been able to take all of England if it wasn't united under one king. But to answer your question more specifically, the conflict between the Vikings and the English, certainly there's, you know, history is told kind of by the victors and the Vikings. I want to be careful how I answer this question, but the Vikings didn't leave us a whole lot of history. Um, The sagas are great, but as I already stated, they aren't fact per se. They aren't true history. And that's not to say the English historians at the time weren't exactly, we, you know, we can't believe a hundred percent of what they write and what's relayed to us. But because of Wessex eventually becoming basically the kingdom of England, they, they do get to write the history to some degree because England becomes such a big superpower. And, you know, when Viking scholarship is sort of revitalized, it's revitalized in Scandinavia too. There's certainly like 
all the ancient kingdoms of Scandinavia. So like the monarchy of Sweden, the monarchy of um, Denmark and uh, Norway, they all have, those monarchies have their roots in Vikings. Vikings set up those monarchies. Um, So I guess the answer is complicated. I think there is a degree, like perhaps one could argue that you know, Victorians were looking to their own medieval history and therefore kind of painting Vikings in a poorer light as the enemy. And the first thing I want to point out is how devastating the Viking raids were for England. Um, Within basically a decade, the Vikings overthrow every English kingdom besides one, besides Wessex. And it's because of the Viking raids that Wessex then is able to kind of fill the vacuum once the Vikings leave England and sort of are integrated into Viking society, um, are integrated, excuse me, into English society. Um, They settle much of England. Wessex then is able to make deals with these different kingdoms and basically unite all of England. That wouldn't have been possible without the Viking raids. The Vikings raiding England and overthrowing so many of the kings there allow for England as a country to exist. The Remedial History Project is a nonprofit working to get women's history into the K-12 curriculum. Our goal is to create free learning materials for educators to use tomorrow. Head over to our website, www.remedialhistory.com. Download everything and give it to a friend. We need women's history in the classroom like yesterday. If you're not a history teacher and you want to do something to help us out, head over to our store. We've got all sorts of fun things for you to peruse, and all of that goes to supporting our mission. If you think what we're doing is needed, you can support the Remedial History Project by becoming a sponsor through Anchor or becoming a patron. Patrons get access to behind the scenes materials, gear, bonus episodes, and more. Most importantly, they're putting their money where their mouth is and helping us get women's history into the classroom. Our history maker, Jeffrey, our history heroes, Christian, Brooke, and Barbara, our historians, Jamie, Kent, Jenna, and Nancy, and our history allies, Nicole, Mark, Sarah, Leah, Anne, and Alicia. Thank you so much. You all make this show possible. To these Norsemen, I should really call them, who were coming to raid, they see these monasteries. And you ha- monasteries were cultural institutions. They were markets. They, you know, th- you don't have unified towns or cities during this time, really. Um, so farmers would come to the monasteries and trade and sell and They were really important to the local economy, monasteries, but they were also in random places. They were the whole idea of monasteries, especially early into medieval history, is they are in remote places, inaccessible places, because the monks were meant to be sort of the conscious for society. They were meant to be God's people be removed from all the vices of humanity. And in order to do that, they wanted to be as far away as possible, you know, from any other people. So that meant that they were in these really remote places, essentially where they couldn't be, get any help quickly. And they were filled with all this lavish gold relics, all this stuff that Vikings were like, this is the easiest place to raid ever. Um, So they show up, they're raiding these monasteries. They raid in France and England a lot. They are raiding and set up a lot of uh, Viking wealth comes via the slave trade. The real, um, you have to always keep in mind when you're talking about this period in Europe, the, the real powerful empire at this time is the Islamic countries in the South. Maybe we shouldn't call them countries, but 
the Islamic presence in the South. It's Istanbul is the largest city in the world, I think, at this point, certainly in the sort of Western hemisphere. And they have such a high demand for labor. And where is that labor coming from? It's coming through the Vikings because they're literally stealing monks and selling them to Islamic owners, which, you know, to monks was like so blasphemous. Um, And it wasn't just the Vikings doing this. This is just kind of the rules of the game in early medieval history. Like this is, it's not just slavery was part of life then, unfortunately. And answer your question about settlement though. So here they are, they're raiding a lot. They're selling monks into the slave trade. They at first are just truly raiding. So they're getting in and out. They're taking these monastery goods. It's very funny, actually, that I mean, not funny, but sort of dark because, you know, many of these monasteries have like relics of the true cross. So it's like this splinter of wood and the Vikings will take it and then ransom it back to the villagers and be like, oh, you want your splinter of wood back? Give us a lot of Dangal. It's called, it's literally like money to pay off the Danes um, called Dangal. And all the English monarchy and all the French monarchy are paying out of their butts for the Vikings to leave. They just will do anything to get them gone. But then there's a shift. There's a shift and Vikings are now looking to settle. And they settle throughout much of Europe. Rollo, which is this Viking um, sea king, they're often referred to by scholars, these sort of kings uh, that would organize these raids. They'd have many people loyal to them, family members, and then sort of different clans attached to them. And Rollo is this one sea king that eventually settles in Normandy and starts one of the most important legacies in medieval history are the Normans. Um, You know, you have the Norman conquest of England, you have the Norman empire in Sicily, you have a crusader state started by the Normans. Um, The Normans are like heavy hitters when it comes to medieval history, especially later medieval history. So that's all there. They have Viking roots and they really in France, the Vikings really integrate into French culture. You have not as many um, words from the Norsemen getting integrated into the the old French at that time. Um, So they really are integrating into their culture and become really the first feudal state of Europe. They kind of, in the, the premier feudal state, the Normans do. In England, things go a little differently. So the English... Yes, they're raiding at first, and then there's the shift, and there's the shift towards settlement. Um, There's this term, the Dane law. The Dane law is the section of Europe underneath Danish law. Uh, A lot of our modern, the roots of our modern English and American laws um, come through the Danes, come from Vikings, the idea of a jury comes from Vikings. Uh, There is a lot in Viking law of sort of, um, you'd be voted, things would be voted on. So a lot of like very, very like seedlings of democracy, we can trace back to the Viking Dane law in England, which is really interesting. But the Vikings that settle in English really retain for a while their, their Viking Norse ways. They don't readily uh, become Christian. They hold on to their pagan beliefs for a while, but they do eventually integrate. And it's actually interesting because Vikings also settle in Ireland and in the Shetland Islands and Scotland and farther north. Um, And eventually, like, there's some Irish kings, Irish Viking kings who try to, make buddy buddy with their old English Viking relatives and the English Vikings, these sort of Anglo Norsemen um, 
eventually kind of realize they eventually realize they have more in common with their English cousins in Wessex than they do with these Viking guys in Ireland. So they, they turn to Wessex for help and they kind of see these Vikings coming in as the outsider. Um, and the Vikings, you know, they settle in Iceland. They're the first people in Iceland. They're the first people in Greenland. They are not the first people in Vinland and they're actually do interact with the huge native population there. It's actually really interesting. I think to, the difference between how the Vikings interact with the natives, the indigenous population in North America at the time versus, you know, Christopher Columbus, you know, they couldn't have been more different. Um, what is different about that interaction? So this is going back to Gudrid's story a bit because Gudrid actually in the sagas, it's really fascinating. So the sagas have this one scene with Gudrid and an indigenous woman. And Gudrid says, my name is Gudrid. And this indigenous woman repeats it back to her. And we know, uh, historical linguists know that that's how, when there's no other, you know, oftentimes they would have translators and stuff when they're raiding in Europe, there would be people who could speak both languages, you know, the Norse language and the English dialect. But that's not the case in, with the indigenous language of these North Americans at the time, you know, this was something totally different from uh, the Norse language and l historical linguists know that when language is first kind of being taught, you know, you think of like a rival, right. With like the teaching, how do you like speak to someone who's so different linguistically to you? Um, but there's this repeating that often happens to learn the language. Um, so that's a scene that gets relayed to us in the sagas, but some historians would say it probably likely happened. Um, but the interaction between the Vikings that land in North America versus Christopher Columbus, the Vikings one are very, there's not a ton, you know, they're a small force, especially at that time, the indigenous North American population they would have come up against would have been huge huge, massive. Um, and we have records of, you know, they would have, the Vikings were in Newfoundland and exploring Vinland for about three years until things kind of went sour and they left. There are some theories that suggest, so Vikings um, cattle was like the animal. For the Vikings, it was the animal of the gods. There was a lot of pride in owning cattle and taking care of cattle. So milk was really precious to the Vikings uh, and all milk products, right? So when there's some theories that suggest that things kind of turn sour for real, the relationship between the indigenous people and the Vikings that were in North America because the Vikings might have given these people milk. And at the time, all the indigenous North Americans that had never come across a cow would have been lactose intolerant. So here are the Vikings giving this thing that gave them all a like super upset stomach. Um, so that might have been something that caused them to riff. And because there were just so many more of the indigenous population, the Vikings, you know, if they overstayed their welcome, they had to get the, get the hell out of there. Um, but we know that there was communication, there was trading. Um, and then, you know, when things turned sour, the Vikings left and basically never came back. They didn't ever come back. And then you have Christopher Columbus who takes indigenous people with him back to Spain and be like, look at these interesting people. I mean, I'm sure he said kind of worse things than that. They have all this stuff. Let's go back and take it from them. There was just not really an understanding that in Europe at the time, in that age of exploration, that Europeans maybe didn't own that land or didn't deserve what was there or shouldn't take it. Whereas the Vikings did have that understanding to some degree. They understood that this land was had people on it. And that was the appeal for the Vikings moving to Iceland and Greenland was that there weren't people there. And at that time, you know, back home in Scandinavia and Norway and Sweden, 
land was at a premium and being a landed class, having land in the Viking world meant you were, you had a higher stature. You had more weight to throw around. Um, but the Vikings understood that the land in the new world wasn't free for the taking. Yeah, bring it back. So I am convinced here that Vikings are important. Sure. I should be teaching them. Get Obviously, it. I love this like comparison that she has drawn between Columbus and the Native Americans it's and amazing. the Vikings yeah. and the Native Americans. Like I think that's a really easy way in a US history class which I teach to bring them in and then of course in a world history class that's like our bread and butter compare and contrast civilizations. I mean, so, it is your jam. If you do live there, it would be an easy one. It would be easy. So, um what I need her to sell me on a little bit here is the whole woman question because this she keeps repeating this idea that like it's debated among historians about women's sure. role and and so I don't want to be you know off on a limb being like and women were there so like what what <laughs> yeah, what, what like evidence does she have that um, women were among the the Vikings in their ventures to the New World, in their raids in right. the UK. Like, what was their role through all of this? Were they caretakers? Were they warriors? Who, you know, what were they doing? What were they doing? How do we know that they were doing that? Um, what was their status? Right? Yeah. Did they lead the charge? Were they you know taking a raid party out on their own? Did they captain a ship? Did they? That is what I'd like to know. Tell us more. We need to know more. So this is what she said. To answer the, your first part of your question, Gudrid's story, and specifically kind of what Gudrid represents, meaning that the female explorers that come to the new world, which is just mind boggling, right? This is the year 1000, give or take. And we have this Viking female traveler in Gudrid who, you know, her story in the sagas, so I already mentioned, but she's mentioned in two sagas, the saga of the Greenlanders and the saga of Eric the Red. Her account in both of those stories differs to some degree, but there's some things that are true across both of them. Um, and what I was discussing with Nancy Marie Brown, who is Gudrid's biographer, she basically makes the argument that if something happened in both sagas, and there was archaeological evidence for it. She was pretty convinced that we could say that was true. That was enough for her. Different scholars might have a different metric of, um, you know, what verifies something as truth. And both sagas say that Gudra is born in Iceland. Both sagas say that she was in Greenland. Both sagas say that she remarries. Um, so she would have been a widow. And as a widow, she would have had the choice of who she married. Um, so we already are dealing with like a fairly independent woman who one of the sagas has being quite wealthy, or even owning a, her own ship. And in owning her own ship, owning a ship in the Viking world was like owning a Ferrari. I, even more than that. It was like owning a yacht. It was, it was huge. It meant that you... It, to build one of these ships would take could take a really long time and would be very expensive. So you really had a, quite a lot of social mobility and were quite wealthy if you owned a ship. And we think Gudrun might have owned a ship according to one of the sagas. Um, and in both sagas, she goes to North America. She goes to Vinland and she has a son in Vinland. And in terms of the evidence to answer that part of your question of how do we know Gudrid was there? How do we know a Viking woman named Gudrid existed? We can't, some might argue, but we know that other people mentioned in the sagas did exist. You have Harold Feinhair that becomes the first king of Sweden or Norway. I'm forgetting which, but He's the first one to unify one of those countries. And so we, we know that these people mentioned in the sagas existed. And 
if Harold Finehair existed, if Leif Erikson existed, why not Gudrid? The only difference is that she's a woman and scholars sometimes get a little snooty to fully commit to saying a woman existed in history, which is annoying. But um, we know that there were women in North America because of this spindle world. So when they, there's the Viking settlement in Newfoundland in Canada in a really remote area in Newfoundland. And it would have been like the staging post for where Vikings would have fixed boats. There's evidence that boats would have been repaired there. And then they would have continued to sail on into North America. There's different scholars who say they made it different ways or different uh, how far they went down the coast. But in this settlement in Newfoundland, known as La Ogs Meadows, we find a spindle world. And the spindle world was, it's such an important discovery because it shows and tells us that women were there because in the Viking world, spinning was solely the role of the women. In the sagas, it's only ever the women who spin. Yes, perhaps a man could have spun, but it's very unlikely. And most scholars are in agreement that because the spindle world was discovered in Newfoundland, there was likely a Viking woman there. And if there was a Viking woman, one Viking woman, there was likely more than one. And so we know that women were there. So the sagas tell us Gudrid was there. So it's only a hop, skip, and a leap to say Gudrid was one of those women in Laong's Meadows staging different explorations of North America around the year 1000. Um, yeah, so that's sort of the evidence that we have for Gudrid. So to answer then the second part of your question, which is very exciting, um, did Viking women fight is sort of this question that has been debated and debated in scholarship. And it will probably continue to be debated and debated in scholarship. The evidence to suggest that women did fight, there is this grave that was uncovered. It's known as the Burka grave. It has one, Burka 461. It is a grave that is clearly of a warrior, of a Viking, you know, someone who raided. Um, this body is buried with a sword. It's buried with two heads of a horse so two horses would have been sacrificed with this person who was buried so women were obviously a part of these sure. viking voyages and um or norsemen voyages as she keeps correcting <laughs> vikings were the people that raided norsemen were the people and um so women were obviously am among the, the people and um what I would love to know more about is whether or not women fought, right? Because yes. a huge yeah. piece of what Vikings are doing is is warring, right? They're raiding and – Well, their goal is expansion, right? Isn't yeah. Isn't like typically what you hear and read is that they want to expand in all directions and conquer? Yeah. Um, and so you have to wonder how they did that with just men. Yeah. And, and, you know, and women were obviously playing roles, but what were, you know, when we think of world history, we think of certain jobs being barred from women, right. but m we don't need to impose that right. thought on civilizations. And so is it possible that women, women were fighting among the Norse raiders. Yeah, and more seen as peer versus subordinate. Right. So she talks a little bit about this grave that they have uncovered. And there is a sword buried in this grave. Um, and it is with a female body. Awesome. And so historians are kind of all over the place and archaeologists are kind of all over the place on what this symbolizes means. yeah and um is this just a symbol of protection that they're sending with her into the afterlife is she a warrior is that a typical thing for um norsemen to be buried with their weapons 
So it's typical for warriors to be buried with their weapons. Okay. So is this symbolizing that she was a a warrior? And one of the things that's that's really interesting is trying to figure out because a lot of the history is being written by us, right? right? More modern people that are taking our, you know, our view of gender and imposing it on people in the past. And is it possible that people buried with swords are just being buried to have something to take into the afterlife? Or are they warriors? Or is the sword symbolic of something else that we're not even yeah, thinking Yeah, like without of? firsthand account. We're really just taking guesses. Right. Informed guesses. But Informed, right. But yeah. still guessing. So, you know, I'm imagining that that's happening throughout history, though. At whatever point you're talking about history, whatever you're living starts to become part of. Right. And the people, I mean, she has reiterated this a bit, which is that the people writing Viking history are super sexist writing from from their time these sort right. of like english victorian historians so i think it's really problematic and i wanted her to weigh in a little bit more on the specifically these grave sites that are right. b- being found so this is what she says so what researchers discovered in this burka grave just to reiterate myself a little bit um is that once they did the dna evidence this grave, this Viking grave of a warrior buried with a sword, buried with this chess piece, which is symbolic of this logical mind. Once they had all of that, they did this DNA evidence and discovered that this grave wasn't what everyone had assumed for a hundred years, wasn't a grave of a man, but a grave of a woman. And suddenly scholars are doing all this backflipping to be like, oh, but she didn't fight. She was a slave who was sacrificed in the place of her owner. She was symbolically maybe a warrior, but didn't actually fight. The sword is only there as sort of uh, a symbolic grave good and not actually something she would have used. There's all this backflipping that scholars have tried to do to convince themselves that this, this grave didn't belong to a warrior. And they might be right, they could be right, but I don't believe they are. (laughs) I believe women fought in Viking society. We have it recorded in the sagas that Viking women fought. Um, We have this grave now and we are discovering more like it. And we know In Viking society, it wasn't a society that was based upon gender in the same way, certainly in Victorian England, and even today. There just wasn't as strict lines between gender. What really divided society was powerful and the weak. There were people who were strong and there were people who weren't. The people who were strong would go and raid. If those people happened to be women, What we know about Viking society would suggest, to me at least, that those strong women would go and fight with the other strong men. And if there were weak men who couldn't fight, they would stay home and not go and raid and not be these Vikings. Not, again, like Viking was the term for a raider. Um, And it gets argued and argued in scholarship. But... I think this grave is pretty convincing. And in the same case as with Gudrid, it's unlikely that it was just this one woman. If one woman was fighting, as this grave would suggest, other women were likely fighting as well. If one woman like Gudrid had traveled to Vinland and uh, conducted this exploration of this new world, this new land, it's likely that other women would have had that power too. Um, So yeah, I'm just, I think the evidence is fairly compelling. So I'm convinced women were there, women crushed (laughs) it. I'm sold. I'm in. Yep. 
So what I need to know is where should I be doing this in my class? Where do yeah. I where do I put these women? How do I get them into a history class? And this is what she said. Yeah, I saw that you had sent that to me. I I know that there's lots of history programs that do cover Viking history, and especially in America, um, for our listeners who are also in the states as we are, there is Leif Erikson, right? There's this Viking traveler who comes to North America that I think is oftentimes talked about in history classes, at least as a footnote, when we talk about the quote unquote discovery of North America. Um, And so when you tell that history, mention Gudrid, (laughs) but don't only just mention her. I think what Gudrid's expedition of the new world in a way, it's a more important expedition than Leif Erikson. Leif Erikson just kind of showed up, was like, yep, there's this land here, and he left. Gudrid's party stayed for at least three years in the New World, had been, and they really could have only existed with the help of the indigenous population. So we know that they're trading. We know that they're um, communicating and friendly with the indigenous population, we know she has a child who is born in Vinland. Um, and I think that's definitely one place, if you're going to mention Leif Erikson, certainly mention Gudrid, certainly mention her expedition. This is an expedition she likely helped fund, um, helped plan with her, her husband. Um, I think another interesting thing is, I would say probably most history classes at least mention Christopher Columbus at the very least as a problematic figure. And when you do that, perhaps talk about the way that these Vikings interacted with indigenous populations, you know, rather than sort of pillaging and taking and literally stealing indigenous people and bringing them back to Spain as sort of show and tell to the Spanish monarchy talk about how these Vikings didn't do that (laughs) and how they were uh, instead respectful and traded. And when things went sour, left and kind of never came and never came back. Um, Actually, An interesting contrast and almost contradictory on their end to how they treated the English. Right. And like, because you were talking about them selling the monks into slavery. (laughs) Yeah. Why, why do you think they had that change of heart? Is that known? (laughs) I don't think it was a change of heart. I think it was circumstantial in England. The Vikings definitely gained the upper hand. As I said, they overthrew most of the kingdoms of England besides Wessex and got very close to overthrowing Wessex as well. Um, in in Vinland, in La Ong's Meadows, the Vikings, we think there's maybe a handful of ships that go with Gudrid's party, maybe three. I can't remember what the saga is, right? But there's not a lot of people. They're definitely outnumbered by the indigenous population in North America. So I think if they had, you know, if it was a situation in England, it's not to say like the Vikings were these like wholesome people. They were products of their time and the time was rough. Um, but that said, yeah, they just didn't have the upper hand. So they kind of were forced to be friendly with the indigenous population in North America, which I think is an interesting thing when you think about Christopher Columbus, maybe, and that here's someone who really believed that he did have the upper hand, you know, he had the backing of this European monarchy and funding and, you know, had also pressure to come back with something, you know, he was trying to find the quicker way to China. Um, So he couldn't just show up empty handed. And I think that is really an interesting thing to look into of what is it, where is, the power dynamic in both of that interactions and who decides that they have more power. I mean, you, you guys are already doing this work in terms of highlighting more women in history and what that really means. But I think a lot of times, even the more interesting question is how does the study of history and the sort of how we learn about history and the different echoes of the different people who've studied that history before you, 
come into how you learn that history today in the present. So not, like when you look at Viking history, you can't almost just look at it on its own. You can try to, but I think you really always have to confront the Victorian echo that the that scholars left on the Viking period and what that has meant for how we understand the Viking period. And that goes for any, you know, part of history. Like if you're looking at Chinese history, like how do the way we perceive China today interact with how we perceive its history of its past? And like, I think those layers are always so interesting. And I think that's something I really didn't start to interact with in a meaningful way until college and would have loved some teacher to be like, but think about this in high school. Like think about why we think about this history in this way. And why is that the case? I think that's always, when we're, especially when we're thinking about women's history, why is it that the Viking period is considered to be sexist? Is that something that's imbued in the Viking period in the archeology? span I think there's something really fascinating, like almost to give students like a record of an archeological dig and be like, what can you learn from this? Almost in the way that historians would. And what are your own biases that you're bringing to this study that you might not even be aware of that are impacting how you're looking at the fact that there was a spindle whirl in Laong's Meadows, you know? I just, I think, peeling back those layers is always at least what I find so fascinating when it comes to the study of history. Wow. Kelsey. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. This is, I'm just so grateful to have gotten the chance to sit down with Sarah and talk about her research. Well, now I want to read everything about female Vikings. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So thank you, Sarah. Now I have to go do some research, but this was awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kelsey. I'm Brooke Sullivan. I'm Kelsey Eckert. See you next time. Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.